Amen. Our epistle reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. This morning we're reading from the 8th chapter, and we'll be reading verses 12 through 25. It can be found on page 916 of your pew Bible, or if you have your own Bible or a Bible app with you, you are free to, feel free to turn to that as well. So let us attend to God's word for us on this day. Paul writes, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought... um, Excuse me. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me, please? Holy God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all of our hearts and our minds, may it all be acceptable in your sight. For you indeed are God. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So how many of you have read Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol? Familiar with that one, right? Do you remember the way it opens? It was with Marley was dead to begin with. And Dickens goes on and says, you've got to remember this. Marley was dead to begin with. Because if you don't remember that, nothing is going to seem wonderful about what I'm telling you. Well, I'm going to say something this morning that is going to probably bother some of you, may make some of you upset, but it's got to be said or nothing that Paul says here will seem wonderful. And what I have to tell you is that that phrase you so often hear, what many of us have probably said, when we say that everyone is a child of God, That's not what the Bible says. Scripture does not tell us that everyone is a child of God. Search through the Bible and see when when the Bible says you are sons, you are daughters, you are children of God, who's being addressed? It's not everybody. It's God's chosen people. That is why Paul has to tell us here in this passage that those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Not everybody. And we hear that and and it's kind of jarring, isn't it? Make you feel a little uncomfortable, perhaps. The fact that we are not all inherently children of God does not mean we are unloved. 
Earlier this summer, Lee and I went back to Iowa for the wedding of a young woman named Bernice, a young woman whom we love dearly. Bernice was our next-door neighbor. She and her family moved in next door when she was five years old, and our daughter Katie was five years old. And they quickly became best friends. And Bernice was at our house all the time. She often ate with us. She played games with us. Uh, you know, she learned to cook uh, in many ways with, with Lee in our kitchen. We love her like a daughter. But she's not actually our daughter. We have no legal uh, responsibility for her, no legal obligation to her, or vice versa. We love her dearly, but she's not our kid. God loves us all dearly, but not all of us are sons and daughters. And the reason that's so important to remember is because adoption means nothing if we're already kids. Okay. The whole point Paul is emphasizing here is that we have been adopted as children of God, as sons and daughters. Okay. We are adopted by the power of the Spirit because of our, our faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. That is what makes us children of God. And that, that is a wonderful thing. Adoption is an incredible thing. And it changes everything about our relationship with God. I was reading this week, uh, reading up on, on adoption, and um, came across a story that, that uh, somebody shared about some friends of theirs, Lori and John, Lori and John had two children of their own, two uh, young boys, and they were doing youth ministry in Nebraska. And in the process, they came to know a young woman named Amanda. Amanda was the same age as their son, and Amanda lived in a horrific situation. Her parents were abusive, her household was, was unsafe, and they... Uh, the state took her out of the home. And so she lived with Lori and John. They loved her and cared for her and sheltered her. But eventually they said to their boys, they said, what would you think if we adopted Amanda? And so at the age of 22, Amanda was adopted by Lori and John. When she was adopted, when she went to the court, she, she received a new name. She even got a new birth certificate. She was now legally their child. And the, the man who was telling this story said, you know, he, he went up to them and said, you know, all this time you, you thought of her as your daughter. So did anything change when you went to the courthouse? And John said, absolutely. When it was official, he says, there was a huge change in Lori and me. Sort of like when you see your newborn for the first time. He said, and for Amanda, there was a change in her too. Now she knew that she belonged. She knew we were her parents. Adoption changes things. Paul tells us that, that it's by the power of the Spirit that we are adopted as God's sons and daughters. He says, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. I should point out there that that may sound kind of sexist. What about daughtership, right? He says you're adopted to sonship, but you have to remember the context. In ancient cultures, in traditional cultures, women can't inherit. They can't inherit, they can't be heirs. So men and women both are adopted into sonship because, as he goes on to tell us, we all become heirs. Okay? So it's not sexist, it's actually broadening things. But he says that. He says, the spirit you received uh, brought about your adoption is into sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. You know, Bernice always referred to, to me and Lee 
as Lee and Kip. She just called me Kip. My daughter, Katie, she calls me Daddy. When we are adopted, our relationship with God changes. God is no longer this distant uh, you know, deity. He is our Father. He is our Daddy. That's what a- Abba means. Okay? Abba is, is Aramaic for Daddy. When we are adopted as sons and daughters, our relationship with God changes, and it is now personal and close and intimate. Right? In fact, this week, try that. In your prayers, when you pray, dear God, Holy Father, whatever you use, switch it up. Pray to Daddy and see how that feels, how it changes your prayers. We are adopted as sons and daughters, and that is a wonderful, incredible thing. And Paul goes on to say, and now if, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. In being adopted into God's family, we are now inheritors of God. Think about that. The one who created all there is out of nothing, the one who created the heavens, the earth, the seas, and all that is in them, we're going to inherit that. What does it mean to to be inheritors of God, to be heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ? What is it we inherit? Well, if if we're co-heirs with Christ, that means that that we're going to have a share in Christ's glory, in his power, in his honor, in his wisdom. We're told that, that when Christ returns, we're going to reign with him. As heirs, God's gonna, he's gonna put us in charge. Think about that. It's a little scary, uh, but it's pretty incredible, isn't it? We are co-heirs with Christ in his full glory and honor and wisdom. That is, that is what is coming. That is what we hope for. But Paul reminds us we're not there yet. But that's the promise. We know where it's going. And so we, we anticipate that. There's that anticipation, that excitement about where God is leading us and it changes our outlook as we live life now. When we see where we're going, if we know what we're inheriting, it changes what we're doing now. You see, if we know that we're inheriting from God, then, then our interests become God's interests. What is God interested in? Mercy, justice, goodness, holiness, wholeness, peace, all those things that are God's interests. They become ours. Not all those, those, those things that we have in our little you know, circle of view about, about you know, sing, shingles on the, on the roof and, and then fixing up the boat or you know, a motor that has gone bad or, or relationships that are, that are you know, messed up. We, our, our interests get wider, broader. We focus on what interests God. And as heirs, it means not only is to our interest shift, okay, it means we're also representatives. Okay. If we're God's heirs, people will look at us in that regard. How often have you, have you seen a newspaper story, a tabloid, about some rich heir or heiress who has gone out and done something really stupid <laughs> and embarrassed their family, embarrassed you know, the, the company, whatever? Yeah. As God's heirs, you know, sometimes we do that. Right? Sometimes we are hypocrites. Sometimes we mess up in, in horrible, embarrassing ways and bring shame to to God's name. But our call as God's representatives is is to do the opposite. Our call is that when when people look at us as heirs of God, they see see God's goodness. They see us behave in ways that bring honor to God, that glorify him. 
And as we, as we live this life in anticipation and hope right now, the other thing that changes is, is what, we, what we work for, where we invest. Okay? You see, as heirs of God, we're, we're investing in our inheritance. Okay? We are to receive God's kingdom, to be put in charge of God's kingdom. So why would we not want to improve that right here and now? As heirs of God in this life, we work toward mercy and justice, welcoming the stranger, caring for the poor, uplifting the needy. We work for justice and righteousness and holiness here and now, investing in God's kingdom. Whether it's through working in the Salvation Army, whether it's in our worship, whether it's in the way we interact with our friends and neighbors, we do those things as investments in what God is doing. Because when Jesus comes back, we're inheriting. And notice one more thing about that inheritance. Paul tells us not that, that we're going to inherit, which means that we're going to be taken away into some spiritual realm separate from things. Paul says no. He says all creation has been groaning right up to the present, awaiting this. Part of what we inherit is creation. And all creation is going to be made new, put to rights when Christ returns. That's what we work for now and that's part of what we're going to be inheriting. And he goes on and says, it's not just our, it's not just our spirits. He says, we wait, await eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. It is as whole human beings, body and soul that we inherit. That is the glory that is promised to us. That is the hope for which we wait in anticipation. And that is why adoption is such a wonderful, amazing, incredible thing. One final thought there. While it is true that not everyone is a son and daughter of of God, at least yet. We need to remember that God's house has many rooms. And that part of what we get to do is to say, look at the family we belong to. You can belong to. We share the joy of our, our being in this family of God with others and invite them in. Salvation, God's inheritance, is not a zero-sum game. It gets bigger and better all the time. And we get to participate in that because we are heirs. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.